Welcome back. Let me quickly recap what we learned from Paul last video. We first downloaded and compiled the vulnerable FFmpeg version from GitHub and used address sanitizer to look at the first crash example. The crash was caused because of a minus one as the HTTP chunk size. In the code we see that FFmpeg simply reads this chunk size as a string and converts it to an integer without checking if it's negative. And in the end this negative size ends up as the length in a mem copy. Now that doesn't really help us and just causes memcopy to write data until it writes into bad memory and sec faults. However, Paul already raised the question at the end of last episode, what if we can somehow get into the else case of this if? Because here maybe the negative size can lead to an actual exploitable condition. And here it gets a bit fuzzy what exactly happens. At least I'm not 100% sure and for Paul it has also been a while since he looked into it. So this read function reads bytes into a buffer, at least as long there is data available. And so if the end of the buffer is reached, indicated by this calculation, if the pointer into the buffer reaches the end, then we get into the other case. And then we execute ffurl read, which calls read try transfer wrapper. So I think this is basically called when not all data has been received yet by ffmpeg and it basically retries to read more data. And apparently in that other condition you trigger then a heap overflow. So, this ASCII picture over here, this should give you an idea on how we're gonna avoid calling memcopy with minus one as a size argument. If there is nothing to read, the buff pitch here will be equal to buff end. And so, we will fall through another branch in HTTP buff read function. And so, what Paul did to not fall into the sec faulting memcopy condition, he delays sending the response so that the following data is handled by a different function. Because ffmpeg consumes the data first and then reaches the end and retries to read more. So this vulnerability has even a timing component to it. You can't send the data all at once. So let's rewrite our response server a bit with all the things we know for now and see how it all works out. I will try to add a sleep function after sending chunk size for ffmpeg to copy the contacts into the buffer, fix the buff put here so it will be equal to the buff end pointer. So on the next attempt to call http buff read function, we will fall through the another branch to trigger the read function, trying to retrieve more data. Let's set a breakpoint in the retry function to see what kind of function is called here. So let's rerun ffmpeg. Continue a bit. Now it is waiting for the 5 second sleep we have in the server, waiting to receive more data. And boom, we get the crash. And when we look back up at the retry function, we were calling tcp read. So that was called before we were waiting for more data of the server. And tcp read is called also with minus 1 as a size. And tcp read is very simple, it simply calls receive. So it calls receive with a huge number, so it can read a huge amount of data into a buffer. That already looks bad. And I think Paul told me that this is not quite where the exploitable heap overflow happens because there is another function that trusts this buffer and copies from it into another buffer and this is then where we overflow. By analyzing a lot of source code, I was able to reckon that the buffer was allocated along with its context in the libavfrmat.avia.buf.c file. Yeah, clearly Paul had to read a lot to figure this out. I was not able to get it in the short time. But you see that all these functions operate on this context and that's a structure that just holds a lot of relevant data for this data processing. And apparently it's allocated close to the buffer that is holding the data we receive. So the buffer was allocated in this function. So here it is. This is the buffer we write into. And here is our context is allocated which means the context is allocated after we have an allocated buffer. And if we get a bit lucky, the buffer might be before the context structure. So if we have indeed a heap overflow, we could maybe overwrite the context structure. So if we get lucky enough, uh, they will be allocated on the heap in the right order. And we actually will be overflowing the context structure itself. Let's look inside it. So here is a vmalloc z is called, and it is actually a wrapper to the actual malloc function. Let's look inside a via context, see what which members it has. Let's check some other members of this structure. So we actually have some function pointers over here. So if we overflow with pointers, we will get immediately the control of the RIP register, which is very nice. So a function pointer is just a variable that contains an address of a function. 
And if we overwrite that value and the function is called, it will call our overwritten address. So Paul figured out that there is a heap overflow happening with the other code path. The buffer is 32 byte kilobytes big, so we could just send more than that and see what happens. I will be sending about 32 kilobytes of data, which will be exactly the size of the buffer and a little bit more to check if we manage to overflow the contact structure. Let's launch our server in the background and uh, launch the GDB to check what happens. So instead of the expected reaction, we have an insertion error over here. Let's scroll up a bit a little bit. Let's open actually this um, file and see why this one was triggered. So this assertion was actually triggered by assuming that the length is more than original length. Uh, so we probably have overflowed the AVIA context structure, but we didn't overflow the right fields. So maybe if we form it somehow in a better way, for example, if we send uh, nulls first and then overflow the pointers with some A's, then we will pass this assertion check and hopefully we will get RIP control. So let's check it out. Let's launch G GDB once again. And there it goes. We have control of RIX and we are currently on the instruction call RIX. Also we have control of the first argument. And once you have control of RIP and RDI registers, it is only a matter of time until you find proper gadgets to get stable wrap chain and achieve code execution. Unfortunately, this exploit is quite unstable because of the property called MTU, which stands for Memory Transmission Unit. It is made for optimizing data transferring process for the network. It breaks large pieces of data into the small packets, and because of that, our read function is not able to receive the whole input, which is more than, 30, than 32 kilobytes, in one take to trigger the overflow. You can actually get your exact MTU value by typing ifconfig command. For example, I have 1500. So that means that all packets will be split by 1500 byte and the exploit will not work remotely as it is. This issue is solvable in general case and you can practice solving it on your own. There we have it. A POC exploit where we get control of the instruction pointer. Awesome. But Paul has another vulnerability which we will look at next time.